Hi, I'm going to pray as we get into our message and also a reminder that if you'd like to make a contribution uh, to our ministry here at Lifeway, uh, we have some options. You can do our giving page at lifewaychurchvista.com or you can mail uh, your contribution to Lifeway Baptist Church, 1120 Highland in the city of Vista, 92083. Lord, I thank you for... Um, people who have a heart to give, even in financially challenging times. I thank you that uh, you have promised us that uh, uh, we don't lack when we follow you. And so I just pray that we would be free to follow you in giving. I thank you that you showed the way, that you were generous, that uh, your church was generous in the New Testament, uh, taking offerings for people in need. And uh, just thank, thankful that we can be a light. And just thank you that you're, you have promised, Lord, um, to meet all of our needs, and I thank you for the people who uh, selflessly give so that your word can go out. I pray that you'd be with us in this message now, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at godly submission. Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. I'm reading from the New International Version, which says, Slaves, submit to your masters with all respect, not only those who are good, <coughs> And consider it, but also those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because he is conscious of, conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Last week, we looked at um, being a Christian in a time when it seems like perhaps uh, we'd rather go our own way than follow the institutions uh, that are in authority over us. Uh, we looked at civil disobedience, and in that time, I I kind of came up with, I think, perhaps a better definition or look at what civil disobedience is than I had last week, which civil disobedience is submit to authority unless it forbids me to do something that God commands, or two, it commands me to do something God forbids. Uh, Peter himself participated in civil disobedience a couple of times that I see in the Bible, once uh, with good good results and once with not so good results. And the not so good results was when he cut off um, a, a, a Roman soldier's ear when he was trying to arrest Jesus. Uh, in all likelihood, he wasn't aiming for the ear. We don't, we generally aim for the head. Uh, <laughs> and Peter and Jesus put this, the, the, the soldier's ear back on and uh, just said, if you live by the sword, you're going to perish by the sword. In Acts chapter 5, Peter and some of the other disciples had been proclaiming the name of Jesus. They were arrested. They were told, you're not going to do that again. And they said, we have to obey God rather than men. So civil disobedience would come when it forbids me to do something that God commands. It commands me to do something God forbids. And a couple of examples we looked at last week were Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which uh, lived in a time when Nebuchadnezzar was king. And he passed some laws that said you can't do what God commands you to do, or you have to do something that God forbids, like worship an idol or not pray to God. And so they were, while being respectful of the, the authority that was there, uh, they disobeyed respectfully. And God was um, always taking care of and watching over them. Today we live in a time where... Um, it just, it's all about loud. And the, what Peter said last week that we looked at was we can silence talk and it, it just, just were dropped into our country. Now it looks like it's BLM versus MAGA. And, um, unfortunately the way this is, uh, uh, shaped in our media, it means, uh, do you want to be 
a Marxist or do you want to be a racist? And uh, Black Lives Matter uh, is, uh, by their own admission on their website, if you go there, is a Marxist organization founded by Marxists. And um, in addition to that, <clears throat> their website states um, that we are guided by the fact that all Black Lives Matter, regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity, gender identity, gender expression, economic status, ability, disability, religious beliefs, or disbeliefs, immigration status, or location. We make space for transgen transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. Uh, we are self-reflexive and do the work to re required to dismantle, which is, uh, in, the, in their words, cisgender, privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women, who continue to be disproportionately impacted by uh, trans antagonistic violence. Um, and so it's like in their pushing of, you know, in, in if you look at either one of those, Black Lives Matter versus Make America Great Again. Well, in, on the surface, I think we're all for, for both of them because we believe Black Lives Matter because we believe all lives matter. Um, do we want to make America great again? Well, I'd rather live in a great country than a sucky country, so sure. Uh, but the, the problem is that it's all about loudness and noise, and you have to really get in to see what, uh, what things are about and what people believe. Um, so, in following this and looking at this, I think it's always that God has a better way. And it seems like in so many times that we have we, we have a, an issue or that in society, uh, we look for man-made ways to do that. In the, 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 the gospel kind of way, the way that evangelicalism looked at that was, and the problems that we're dealing with and talking about now was uh, to look at what's called, to bring in what's called liberation theology. And the problem with liberation theology, which I believe in many ways is the problem with some of the uh, solutions that are put out there today is, if you get your way, you become the thing that you hate. And liberation theology said it's not fair for this group to have all the power and all the money. Instead, we should have all the power and all the money. So after this struggle, it's those who were in power and had the money that will be subjected to uh, those of us who will now have the power and the money. Uh, so if you believe that that was unjust when they had the power and the money, then I think it's unjust when you have the power and the money. Uh, Black lives matter. Um, of course they do. Uh, but really, if you can't say all lives matter, then aren't you just substituting uh, one type of racism for another? Uh, if we can't say all lives matter, so this week I took a little time and had some resources, uh, some teaching by a pastor named Mark Driscoll and some uh, writing in the Christian Post. And I put together what I hope makes sense as a godly route to equality in our time. And it's like it is the best way because it acknowledges God and how he created us. It's like if we um, deny how we were made, God made us man and woman. If we deny that uh, uh, life begins in the womb, then how is that solution really going to be a solution? Uh, the, the problem with so much, uh, so many of the movements is they adequately diagnose a problem, but they then they turn around and say ours is the only solution when really God has the best solution. So in what I see as a godly route to equality in our time is first to recognize all people are created by God and made in His image. If we would just start with that, then that would change how we look at each other, wouldn't it? Number two, we are all one family or race made up of all nations and cultures descended from Adam and Eve. We can all trace our roots back to Adam and Eve, really to Noah and his wife as well. But shouldn't it make a difference that we're really all family? Uh, that's what the Bible says. And that's a much better foundation for having equality than anything else I'm hearing today. Number three, we need to recognize everyone is a sinner. And therefore, every group or organization, its goals and its effectiveness is affected by human sin. The reality, there's not going to be a perfect manly solu solution to the problems that plague us of inequality, of racism, because we're all sinners. And we bring that sin into whatever we do. Uh, and if we form an organization, then that's there as well. So we have to acknowledge that and, and realize that our hope isn't in humans or human organizations, but our hope is in God. Number four, we need to see that God establishes laws to provide equality 
for all people. And what we'll look at as we get further into this passage I just read is that um, <laughs> it's not always easy to, as a believer to deal with the laws that are placed by men. But God establishes laws to provide equality uh, for all people. If we live by God's laws, really live by God's laws instead of misinterpreting them through our sin, uh, we'd be much closer to equality. Number five, God's kingdom is the pattern for justice and social order for those in and under authority. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about authority, and if we would follow our uh, <laughs> politics after God's kingdom, we'd be doing much better. Then number six, God's people are, call, are a new family called a chosen people. In 1 Peter 2, 9, which we looked at last week, uh, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If we looked at our godly rights instead of our civil rights or human rights, uh, we would become the people that God calls us to, and we would eliminate uh, the sin that's dividing us so much today. Number seven, leadership in the church is, at least it should be, based on character, not on social factors. Um, if we live in the kingdom of God, it's, it's more who we are than, than how much money we have or a position of power that we have. And this is seen uh, with Onesimus and Philemon. Um, Philemon was a slave in Bible times. Onesimus was his owner. They won't, both went to the, to, to the same church. Uh, Philemon had a higher position because of his character in the church. And Paul uh, asked the Onesimus release of Philemon. Uh, and that's the way that, um, that it was in the church. We're not looked at by the color of our skin or our social position, but by our godly character. Um, and then number eight, just recognize Christianity is the most diverse movement in history. Uh, when you look at what the church is and what it covers, it's amazing. Uh, so many people, especially in this country, look at the church and think it's a bunch of old white people, but it is absolutely not. Uh, it's anticipated that soon Africa will be the uh, will be the center of Christianity, having more Christians than any other con continent. Uh, in China, the the, mo the most vibrant, strong church uh, out of uh, just complete um, uh, subjugation to the government, and yet they're growing strong. Uh, the, there's church in every continent and every um, uh, every type of people, every ethnic group. Uh, Christianity is involved. Uh, it is, I believe, I, you know, if you have a different opinion, let me know, but I believe Christianity is the most diverse movement in all of history. And it stems from the fact that when we're really living the godly values that we find in the Bible, God's not a respecter of persons, and neither should we be. Why is that? Because we have heroes who divide conventional wisdom, believed the truth and power of the gospel, and took it around the world to people who are valued by God but still needed the gospel as much as any of us. Again, thinking about Africa, isn't it amazing that people of the same color of, of skin uh, went there to, to give them the gospel as the same color of skin who went to colonize and put them into slavery. And yet Christianity in sub-Saharan Africa is uh, amazingly strong. Um, we have heroes who gave their life because they valued all life around the world. And as I shared a few weeks ago, uh, the founders of Sudan Interior Mission, uh, they gave their life, died, knew, uh, virtually certain that they would die of malaria to go and spread the gospel in Nigeria, in Sudan, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And yet they were so committed to the people that they went ahead and did that. And the fruit of that uh, is still there in, in Africa, m much of Africa today. We have heroes who, as missionaries, went to India and to China, and that's why the gospel is there as well today. So the fruit of unjust suffering, and that's something that we all deal with, and it certainly is something that, that Jesus dealt with and had to, uh, to, to, go, to go through with. But there is fruit that comes from that. First Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 21 says, Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. Not only those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because he is conscious of God. And that runs in the face of pretty much everything that we would hear today, that it's commendable, um, essentially, 
the Bible tells us to do our best wherever we're planted and to, uh, to, to shed light, to be salt and light wherever we are. And even if uh, it leads us to being unjust or we're just found in an unjust position when we meet the Lord, Peter says that uh, through the Holy Spirit, that it, it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. How can that be? Well, because that's what God as a man experienced. Verse 20, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. So the, di the, the difference is, is what, are, what are we doing? That's the key thing. Not what are other people doing, but what are we doing? And the Bible is much more of a mirror than it is a, a pair of binoculars. And most people want to use it as binoculars to look at other people and say, what are you doing? And what are you doing wrong? And what's wrong with you? But really, the Word of God is best used as a mirror, which reveals our own heart. Verse 21, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. It's a sad thing, but hard thing, that that is what the Bible says over and over again many times, that part of following him is suffering. And it's sad that there are so many pastors and Bible teachers today who don't teach that at all. When it's such a prominent part in the Bible, Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Uh, we don't, if we're really following him, we're not going to escape that. But the important thing is to see the fruit of unjust suffering. Number one, unjust suffering makes me grateful to Jesus. When someone does something unjustly to me, it's easy for me to look at Jesus and see what he endured because of my sin. Um... It makes me more thankful for what Jesus did because he was perfect and he took the ultimate, he took the sins of the entire world on himself. He was separated from God the Father because of those sins and he did that for our sakes. So unjust suffering, when, when things that should not happen to us happen to us, it should just give us another opportunity to be even more grateful for all that Jesus did for us. Next, unjust suffering allows me to be comforted by Jesus. Unjust suffering allows me to be comforted by Jesus. His promise is that he will never leave us or forsake us. And I know that the times when I stand up for, for Jesus and uh, feel like uh, something unjust happens to me, I feel his presence in an incredible way. Um, some of the best times I spend with my granddaughter are when she gets hurt. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's, you know, my fault. But just when she's hurting, to hold her on my, in my lap, she's eight, uh, and to, to hug her and just give her a kiss on the forehead and, and say it's going to be okay. Those are beautiful times that we wouldn't experience if she didn't get hurt. And as a believer, sometimes we have to get hurt to really know what it is like to be comforted and loved by Jesus. Then thirdly, unjust suffering makes us more like Jesus. Unjust suffering makes us more like Jesus, because Jesus suffered unjustly more than anyone in the history of the world. And so we, when we get a taste of that, uh, it helps us to be more like him. I have a little asterisk there. Uh, eternal suffering is the worst kind of suffering. Eternal suffering is the worst kind of suffering. In the victim mentality that we have, and I'm not saying there aren't victims, but uh, it seems like we want to focus so much on, on victimization and that. It's just like every type of suffering becomes the worst. Every type of injustice becomes the worst. But realistically, we have to see that that is nothing compared to the eternal suffering of being separated from Jesus in hell for all of eternity. Um, there is no suffering that you can experience here on earth that compares to that at all. So if the Bible says that it is commendable to hold up under unjust treatment, then I believe that. And I believe that because God has an eternity for me when all of those wrongs will be made right and every tear will be wiped away. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 say, Therefore do not lose heart, though outwardly, or outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen 
is eternal. Whatever physical thing we're striving for or that, it's going to be gone. But the eternal glory promised us uh, as followers of Jesus is amazing. Uh, we all have an eternity in store, eternal suffering, eternal joy. Uh, it's not found by seeking justice, it's found by following Jesus, who was the most unjustly um, treated individual in all of human history. Uh, verse 18 um, the, of chapter 2 starts with the word slaves. And I think it's easy to kind of slip over that. A lot of pastors talk about, well, that just talks about, you know, like, like your job and stuff like that. But the reality is slavery is in the Bible in three forms. Uh, the first is a slave trader. Uh, and this is literally just what it means. The Greek word is andra potestes, uh, and it literally means men stealers. And these were the people that would uh, deal in, in human trafficking to, or human uh, selling of slaves. We find that... Uh, that word in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 says, We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, and for those who kill their fathers, mothers, uh, uh, today fathers and mothers kill their children, uh, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers. And for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Why do we have laws? Well, it's not for the, for the righteous, it's but for the lawbreakers, and all of us are that in some degree. That's why we have laws. We hate laws because they, uh, of what they keep us from doing, but we need laws because of who we are. And one of those things talks about uh, one for, form of slavery that's mentioned, that is the slave traitor. A second is a prisoner of war. If you look at uh, the scripture and you look at human history, uh, it's a little different today. Uh, after we defeat a country, we go and give it all kinds of aid and, and try to build it up. Um, uh, in, in ancient times, if you defeated a country, you owned it and all the people as well as the property and that. And as a result of that, uh, much of the slavery of ancient times was the result of people just being what we would consider prisoners of war. Again, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who I talked about earlier, that's who they were. Uh, Israel was overthrown. Judah was overthrown by Babylon. And therefore, its people, uh, the ones that they wanted anyway, were taken to uh, Babylon and held there uh, for what they could provide for them. Uh, even in that place, we see Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, submitting to the authority of those who held them captive, but submitting even more to godly authority. And they saw great things happen. The word for slave that is used the most is doulos, and it means bond servant or, or bond slave uh, in the Greek. It's how it's used here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 20 through 23, where it says, each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave uh, when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. So in other words, be content in whatever situation you find yourself, but go for your freedom uh, if you can. Uh, verse 22, for he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. Similarly, similarly uh, he who was a freeman when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. But we are called to be slaves or servants of Christ. And mostly the bond slave or that was more of a financial agreement. It's kind of like uh, if you want a house and you don't know how else to get it, you you sign up for some military service, then you get the GI Bill. Uh, you're basically saying, well, I want a house, so I'll give my, my three years or whatever to the military, and then I'll get my house. Or a student loan, however much you borrow, then whatever it takes you to pay that back, uh, you're really working for somebody else. And uh, so much of the economy of that day... Uh, it's been said, I've read, that 50% of ancient Rome were slaves, half of the people. Uh, in the United States at the time of the Civil War, it was like 10% of the population. But in Rome, literally 50% of the people were usually the bond slave or the, uh, or the bond servant um, type of that. And so it, it was there. It was a part of history, and it was really in all cultures. But what we need to see is that Jesus is the victim of our sinful injustice. Jesus is the victim of our sinful injustice. 
In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through to 25, it says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in him, uh, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep growing ast going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. Jesus is the victim of our sinful injustice. Some things to look at and to remember um, from that scripture. Remember Jesus' example. Ungodly action requires godly reaction. Going back to the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was, was arrested. That was unjust. It was ungodly. But Jesus responded with, God, with a godly reaction. Next, our goal as Christians is to win people, not arguments. You can win an argument and lose people. Um, virtually everybody walking around in the world today, everyone walking around, has received some type of wound. And just as Jesus was sensitive to our hurts, we need to be sensitive to others as well. That's why we need to react uh, godly even when uh, we are hit with something ungodly. Our goal as Christians is to win people. The Bible says it's, it's God's kindness that leads people to repentance. And we need to express and to have that kindness um, and show that kindness to other people as well. Even though Jesus was the victim of our sinful injustice, he passed on grace. Then finally, remember that Jesus was the ultimate victim and we were the oppressors. Jesus was the ultimate victim and we were the oppressors. It was the sin of all of us that put Christ on the cross. Some people say it was the Romans who killed him. That's partly true. Some people say it was the Jews. That's partly true. But it was a Christian, a follower of Jesus, named uh, Judas, who betrayed him. It was Peter uh, who denied him. It's so uh, we all, it, it was all of our sin that put Jesus on the cross. And that brings us to this beautiful place of Peter and the shepherd, because in the the last part of the of our passage, uh, Peter goes back to uh, the imagery of a shepherd. In verse 25, he says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Like a sheep, Peter went astray too. He denied who Jesus was the night that Jesus was arrested. He cursed a, a little girl because she dared to insinuate that perhaps he was a follower of Jesus. And yet, Jesus invited him back into the fold. And so the words of Jesus in verse 25 are very powerful when he says, For uh, you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls, just as Peter did with Jesus. And we see this in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, when he said, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, do you truly love me more than these? Because Peter had said, well, they all, all the rest of them may fall away. I never would. And Peter responded, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. So here, uh, Peter has, uh, Jesus has told the story of the, the one sheep that leaves the other 99 and goes away, and Peter and, and, and the shepherd goes after him. And Jesus says, Our good shepherd, uh, just as Peter has heard Jesus talk, realizes that the Good Shepherd has come for him as well and brought him back into the fold. Um, and he is now the shepherd, shepherd and overseer of our souls. So the question for you today is, are you with the shepherd? It doesn't matter how many movements you're a part of or how much justice you think that you bring to this world. But ultimately, the question is, 
Are you a sheep who's with the shepherd, or are you a sheep who's wandered away? If you're a, a sheep who needs the shepherd, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we all like sheep have gone astray, each of us to our own way. And yet you are the good shepherd. And Lord, for anyone who's listening who needs to be with the good shepherd, Jesus, now, I pray that you would forgive sins, that uh, sins would be confessed and forgiven, that lostness would be replaced by foundness. And Lord, that the desire of all of our hearts is that we would feed this flock, which is your family, together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this morning. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me through our website, www.lifewaychurchvista.com, and I'd be happy to be in touch with you, especially if you need uh, to be uh, one of the sheep who is with the Good Shepherd. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you about that. So God bless you, and we'll see you next week.